Hey, Joseph, how's it going? Hey, Kayla, doing well. Thanks for inviting me. It's great to be here. Of course. Yeah. So, of course, I want to talk all about the Federal Reserve with you today. So the Fed is expected to hold rates steady at their meeting this week because inflation is kind of stuck at elevated levels. There's a 97 percent of no rate cuts. So assuming we don't get some sort of shocking announcement, what's the importance of this upcoming meeting? Yeah, I think in order to understand this meeting, we should level set a little bit. So in the second half of 2023, for six months, the Fed's inflation target, PCE, has been at bang on 2%. So in December, Chair Paul was, was looking at this, and I think that he was feeling a bit more comfortable where inflation was headed. And so in December, the market seemed to perceive somewhat of a pivot where maybe the Fed you know, is, is going to start thinking about easing. And that seemed to set off a significant rally across the market. Now, coming to this year, in January and February, and March, we were getting inflation prints that were above expectations. Now, in March, our most recent FOMC conference, Chair Powell was asked about these hotter than expected inflation prints in January and February. And, you know, he, he was surprisingly quite dovish about that. So when I asked about that, he was basically like, yeah, you know, that's all seasonal stuff. And, and you know, by our own calculations, yeah, that's not too bad. Okay. But recently, though, I think he's really changed his tune. His most recent public communication was with, at a conference with Governor Tiff Macklin of the Bank of Canada. And at that meeting, he made a point to say that he was not satisfied with the progress on inflation. And that seemed to mark a noted pivot in his approach. So at the March FOMC, the Fed was penciling in three rate cuts this year and was expecting PC to be about 2.6% at the end of the year. Now, this, these recent prints suggest that PCE uh, is not on track to go to 2.6%. Uh, it's, it's on track to be probably a bit above 3%. Again, a lot of things can change. And so today, the market is pricing in just under 1.5 uh, cuts this year. So the market has become increasingly hawkish as well. So I think the expectation this week is for Powell, keeping in mind the hotter than expected inflation prints we got just last week to reaffirm this hawkishness. So I don't think he's going to be thinking about three cuts this year. I, I think it's probably going to be less. But again, a lot of things could change. Remember, in the beginning of the year, in January, the market was pricing in seven cuts. And now we're pricing in you know, one and a half. So this is a very volatile, uh, volatile market. Yeah. And when you look at how equities are responding to this, what does higher for longer mean for them? So I think traditionally you would look at equities and think that, you know, higher interest rates, that's negative for equities. And I think in 2022, we did see a very strong reaction to the equity market when the Fed was raising rates, right? That was a really bad year for equities. But what I've noticed over the past year in 2023, the market seems to be a bit less sensitive to that. It, le it seems to be a bit more comfortable. Now, I suspect that just as a few years ago, when everyone was thinking a 5% Fed funds rate is going to crush the economy, it's going to crush the housing market, you know, that, that just didn't happen. The economy continues to grow above trend, housing market continues to march higher. So I think there's something different about today's economy. I suspect that the significant amount of fiscal spending we're getting has supported the real economy and will also make the financial markets more resilient to these higher than expected interest rates. So at the moment, I think the equity market looks like it's becoming adjusted to the prospect of higher interest rates, or at least a higher for longer framework. And, you know, maybe they will just shake it off like they did uh, in the middle of last year. And we saw a softer than expected GDP print uh, recently. How do you think Fed Chair Jerome Powell is weighing all of these various data points in terms of the decision that he has to make, not only for this upcoming meeting, but the meetings beyond? So that is actually a really good question and what I will be focusing on for this meeting. So as we know, the Fed has a dual mandate, right? Full employment and price stability. So we know the inflation part isn't really going their way. Now, the growth part is a bit more complicated. Like you suggested, on the surface, headline uh, GDP printed at 1.6% for the first quarter, much lower than expectations and below trend. But a lot of the professional economists are looking at this and saying that if you filter out more volatile components like net exports, so the GDP data, like the CPA data, has some volatile exports. 
when we look at CPI, we like to get rid of volatile components like energy and food because that goes up and down a lot. Now, GDP, similarly, exports goes up and down quite volatile. When we take out those volatile components, it looks like uh, the core, oh, not so much, so uh, consumer core sale, final sales consumers were, were much stronger than expected, or at least not indicative of a recession. So it's possible that the Fed could focus on that print and feel like the economy is still doing well, or they could focus on the headline print and be more cautious. So I don't know what they will focus on. Um, I think it gives them leeway to go either way uh, when it comes to monetary policy. Yeah. And I mean, it's very tough to be a central banker right now. You know, one thing that will maybe impact the Fed's decisions coming up is the election that we have at the end of the year. So the Fed has cited inflation as one of the biggest risks to financial stability. But then, you know, the 2024 election is also another potential risk. What political influence do you think that'll play with the Fed's decision making process? So the Fed will tell you that they're not political. And, you know, I, I believe that they try not to be. But oftentimes, politics is just a difference in priorities and values. And in that sense, your personnel is policy. When I look at the composition of the FOMC, I, I notice that President Biden has made a number of appointments. And, you know, over the past couple of years, a lot of the Fed's policies have been in line with what President Biden has been saying. For example, uh, the White House was quite adamant on transitory inflation in 2021, and the Fed kind of just copied them. So I, I think that the, the Fed would prefer uh, one candidate over the other, but I don't think that they would overtly influence policy in that sense. But uh, I do believe people there uh, do have a preference for a, a particular candidate. Yeah, I don't think they would influence policy either. And um Former President Trump, candidate for the 2024 election, has come out to say that he would reduce power for the central bank if elected. So if is the Fed at risk of losing its independence? That's a tough question to answer. But is that something that you've thought about? Oh, think? yeah. So again, as I suggested, so central bank influence, uh, central bank independence is something that changes over the over the years. So, you know, over the past few decades, you know, we think of our central bank as being pretty independent, but it was not always the case. In the 1980s, people often thought of Chair Burns as someone who was, you know, trying to curry favor with the president. And in the 1940s, we actually had a Fed that had to set interest rates in consultation with the Treasury. And the Treasury oftentimes would tell them, no, you got to keep rates low. So it's something that varies over time. So it's not set in stone. It's something that could change. And it looks like we may be moving towards a world where maybe the executive has more influence on monetary policy. Maybe we will have it chair Trump. Now, I don't know if that's going to happen, but uh, I would just note that this is something that changes over time. And it looks like we're, we're just kind of moving back to how we were in another era. Yeah, and it is on both sides, too. I think there is another piece talking about the Biden administration saying that Biden should potentially be weighing in on interest rate decisions a little bit more. And I guess the big question there, and I think part of the reason that the Fed is pseudo-governmental or pseudo-governmental, uh, is that um, they don't want to have short-term thinking. So do you think that if the presidents did weigh in, would that create problematic conflicts of interest? So I would definitely create the perception of conflicts of interest. Uh, whether or not it creates actual conflicts, I think that's you know, probably because obviously at the end of the day, you know, Fed is part of the government and they have to be accountable to the elected government. So I think it does influence their actions somewhat. Um, but, you know, the broader sense is that one of the things about monetary policy is that it ultimately serves the people. So in a sense, maybe it's not unreasonable for monetary policy to be a more, bit more responsive to pe the people who are actually elected to, uh, to Congress or, or to the White House. Yeah, definitely. It's, um, there's, I think right now the Fed has more questions than answers. Would you agree with that statement? It, it's definitely not an easy time to, to be doing monetary policy. And, and I'll add one more thing, too. So this is something that we saw in the 1940s as well. So the Fed is in charge with you know, price stability, right? 
But the sad truth is price stability is not just about interest rates. Other things matter as well. And if you look at the annual reports of the Fed in, say, 1945, they'll tell you, you know, inflation is in part having to do with interest rates and credit policy, but it also has to do with things like fiscal spending. And as we move to a world where I think the fiscal authorities are more active, the Fed is just not going to have the tools to accomplish their mission. So they are put in an impossible place where they have to do something but are just not able to. So that's going to be, I think, the story of the coming years. I mean, even if you look at what higher interest rates are doing, there's theories that they're actually exacerbating the housing crisis by making it more expensive to build homes. So high interest rates are potentially even causing inflation, which I think is tough. Yes. And Warren Mosler is very famous for making that point. Um, If you have higher interest rates, you're basically increasing the interest income of the public. And interestingly, in the 1950s, President Truman was adamantly opposed to higher interest rates because, in part, He's, he thought, well, if you have high interest rates, the fiscal deficit is just going to blow out and that's going to be inflationary. So there is, it is a complicated question that I think that uh, merits more thought than simply interest rates high, inflation down. Yeah, definitely. Well, I think that's a great spot to leave it. Um, thank you so much, Joseph. Where can people find your work? Yeah, so if you're interested in hearing my thoughts, I have a YouTube channel. It's called Joseph mm-hmm. Wang. And each week I post weekly videos on markets. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thanks.